here at the Shelter Rock Jewish Center, and we're just going to kind of take a little preliminary footage before we start uh, speaking. Well, the Bulgarian Jews actually uh, survived. The Macedonian people did not. But that was the thing, and by the way, I just happened to write, write about this here because when I did this piece for Congress mm -hmm. Monthly, there was a wonderful response from Alfred Lieberthal, who was saying, well, yes, you know, this is good, and I, I really don't want to, you know, this is important, but what about Bulgaria? Mm -hmm. And there's always this belief that Bulgaria saved everyone, but Bulgaria did not because they deported from Macedonia and Thrace. Yes, exactly. About twenty-five thousand. Exactly. Yeah. Sure. Well, of course. So that leaves Albania as the only country that Macedonia. Right. Yeah. But from Thrace, also the combination right. was about twenty-five thousand people. And that's Mr. Sampson, who we met at B'nai B'rith for the last two years at the UN, and in fact, he's being blocked right now by someone. Let me see if I can get over here. Yeah, okay. There we can just about see his face, Bob Sampson. Right. Okay, and then we have a nice gathering of people coming to hear Shirley and me speak about rescue in Albania. So it is my privilege to introduce our guest speakers. And as you know, just, uh, uh, former Congressman Joseph Diogati and Shirley Cloyes Diogati, a distinguished married couple, each of whom independently and both together have a biological background of incredible intelligence, influence, involvements, perspectives, achievements, and activities, which you, you will hear about this morning. We will hear about. It's our pleasure to have you both. Thank you. And hear this morning. I shall briefly describe to you both, both of our speakers individually. The Honorable Joseph Diabati was born and raised in the Bronx, graduated from Fordham University with honors in 1962, and was a practicing CPA who served 22 years with the international accounting firm of Arthur Anderson and Company. He became the first practicing certified public accountant ever elected to the United States Congress. He was the first member of Congress to bring the issue of Albanian rights in the Balkans to the attention of the U.S. government through a congressional resolution that he sponsored as a new member of the House of Representatives in 1986. He is the founding volunteer president of the Albanian American Civic League, which is the only registered grassroots lobby representing the concerns and interests in Washington, D.C. of Albanian 750,000 approximately Albanian Americans. He and Shirley have made many visits to the areas involved and to uh, Israel where they attended a ceremony at Yad Vashem honoring the saving role of Albanians during the Holocaust. What I just described about each of our speakers does not even come close to the many, many activities in which they have been involved and still are involved, individually and as a couple. They are remarkable. Their bio is sensation. And ladies and gentlemen, friends, it is my pleasure to introduce the Honorable Joseph Diabwater and his wonderful, wonderful wife, Thank you, Howard. Thank you so much for that great introduction. And it's a pleasure for us to be here. Shirley will follow me. And we'll do this separately because we wanted to divide it in a logical way. Um, but I wanted to say that we have been very active with Jewish organizations. Certainly I have because I represented Westchester County, New York. 46 synagogues in my district. I visited every one of them as a congressman. I didn't care whether it was orthodox, reform, conservative, uh, but I wanted the Jewish people to know who I was 
even though we may have differed on certain issues, uh, you have to look at the human side, especially today. Don't get caught up in party labels. Look at the person. My wife's a registered Democrat, I'm a registered Republican. We got married, we lived together. I told that to my constituents, if I can live with a Democrat, you can vote for me. <laughs> a liberal Democrat, besides. The point is that you, you need to understand America is in trouble. And I do most of my speaking, not on this issue, uh, but on the issue of fiscal responsibility, public accountability in Washington, because we're spending money we don't have, we borrow from countries that don't share our values, and there's a tsunami going on the next generation that is not fair. We're back to taxation without representation. The next generation, still to be born, will be born with a mortgage that is certainly going to be as subprime as anything you've seen. Because we now have 12 trillion as of the end of the fiscal year. We're going to have 20 trillion, they say, within 10 years. And that's not the bad news, that's the good news. The bad news is that Social Security and Medicare are not included in that, and that's another $45 trillion for people who are living today has to be paid. Where are we going? My father would not have bought the house and moved from the Bronx. We had a grocery store, we had a grand conference, if he didn't have the money in the bank. He refused to borrow it. Look what we've done now, giving mortgages to people who have their jobs. They don't ask for income statements. Just to gain the system to make money, read. Now, whatever your spiritual background is, you know, I guess love permeates everything we do, if you believe in God, as I do, surely it does, and, and you do. But we have to understand that part of that love has to be, in a way, conserving this beautiful country for the future, and we're not doing that, okay? I'll come back and speak again on that subject alone, and you can have my book, Unaccountable Congress, It Doesn't Add Up, a CPA's perspective from the inside, why you're not seeing the real information. Government is lying to you, collectively. They don't want you to know the real national debt, the real deficits. Now that I have your attention, <laughs> let me tell you that. I am so pleased to be here, uh, and thank you, uh, Bob Sampson, for bumping into us twice at the Benaborith uh, events uh, in New York City. Uh, I think it was for the Kodak Company, Human Rights, their director of Human Rights. The other one was at the UN. And if everything goes well, because we know Dan Mariachi very well, we visited him many times in Washington, Shirley and I should be speaking on January 27th at the UN, hasn't been confirmed yet, because we have things, we haven't stopped on this issue. We have found things that are so incredible, you don't even know. You're going to feel it's incredible just to hear what we're telling you today that you don't know. But there's stuff we have not announced yet. But Yad Vashem already knows about it uh, because they granted the first righteous uh, award to an Albanian from Kosovo this year. All right? So Kosovo plays a big role in what you're going to hear. And Shirley will tell you about that. Don't forget, Kosovo has 2 million Albanians. Well, 2 million people, 95% of whom are Albanians. Okay? And I'm going to give you a little jargon. So now, let's go back to how this came about. You might say, Dio Boy. It's a beautiful Italian name, and it is beautiful. It comes right from the Latin, Dio, God, Guardi, protect. So every time you say my name, you're saying a prayer, and you don't know it. God protects, okay? So I got to Congress, and I didn't know when I was being raised in the Bronx, in an Italian-American neighborhood, that my father was speaking, don't forget, he came here, well, you don't know, he came here in 1929, speaking two languages. I now know. Italian and Albanian, not a word of English. 15 years of age, 29, bad time, they lived in Harlem, and uh, thank God he was resourceful enough, they were farmers, who comes here? Not the elite, but the people looking for jobs in the farming class. So my father had no education, fourth grade in Italy. My mom, she had eighth grade. She had to work on the lines for producing pies for Brooks Brothers with her four sisters. They couldn't go to high school. This was America, as, as I heard from them. I wish the young people today understand what built this country. People like that struggling. And they got together, they got married, they had a grocery store in the Bronx. I was raised pretty much in the back of that grocery store. I had to go there after high school. Many times in the morning, my dad was not feeling well. I had to go with him four, three, four o'clock in the morning to load the truck at the Bronx Terminal Market by the Yankee Stadium. So you might say, I'm the oldest of three. I was the one that 
really was raised European in my family, and that's a great bridge to have, to, to be raised with that discipline and to come here and then go to Congress. I feel I have something special to offer, especially the young people, about what, what they have to do. Now, when I got to Congress, uh, nobody knew that my family had this Albanian background. And in fact, in this Italian-American neighborhood, uh, I noticed that my father would be shifting the way he spoke to his grandma, to my grandmother. We lived with her until I was six. And I always knew my grandmother didn't have an education. There was something about the Turks, but she couldn't explain it. I kept asking her as I got more curious as I grew up, can you get me a book? I want to read this story about how you say you got to Italy and it was the Turks. Well, my first fundraiser as a congressman on my birthday in September 20th, 1985, my father was alive, my mother was alive, and they were proud. I'm you know, now a congressman representing Westchester County. And my father brought his family with him. And he was overheard speaking his language, which I thought was a fancy dialect of Italian, to Albanians from Yugoslavia, Kosovo, Macedonia, Montenegro. And they came running up to me. They were brought there by uh, an Irish-American who was finance chairman for me, uh, Bill Casson, now deceased. And he had them working for him on his construction jobs. And they came up, Joe, your, your, your father's speaking in Albanian. We thought you were Italian. We came here to support you anyway, but what's this all about? He said, well, you know, I know in my family, going back, there's this Albanian heritage. My grandmother tried to tell it to me, and, and I guess, you know, it may go back to the Roman times. And I, no, no, you're from Kosovo. <clears throat> Kosovo? Where's Kosovo? And would you believe it? They came to my house in Scarsdale every week with books, with letters, with information to empower me, and I realized I was discovering my real, my family's real roots. Although my parents were born in Italy, or my mother's Italian from Bari, my father, believe it or not, comes from the Albanians who fled the Ottoman Turks in the year 1488 when the Turks overran Albania. It's the Albanians that saved the rest of Europe from being Islamic. Why are the Albanians today in Albania 90% Muslim, uh, in, in Kosovo 90% Muslim? and 70% in Albania. And by the way, they were forcibly converted. They were all Christian 600 years ago. You probably don't know that. And they've lived in, in, in great tolerance with all religions, including Jews, because Albania and Kosovo have had Jews since the first century in the common era. And Joe's gonna tell you how they got there. From the burning of the first temple, 70 AD, Jews fled all over, came to the Balkans. The Jewish families from those days went back to Israel. I helped with Harvey Sarno, who wrote this book, with the information we gave him, Rescue in Albania. You're gonna see the beautiful connection between the Jewish and the Albanian people. Historically, not just the Holocaust that you're gonna hear from Shirley. It's a wonderful story. And sure, sure enough, the Spanish Inquisition, more Jews came into Albania and Macedonia and those areas. And then the final refuge was from Hitler himself, and the Albanians did not give up one Jew, not the 400 families that lived there, some, for almost 2,000 years, and not one of the 2,000 that were lucky enough to escape from Yugoslavia and Western Europe, because they heard, if you get to Albania, you are saved. These people will risk their lives. And this is the story that's in this book, and you're all gonna get a copy of this book before you leave today, because it's not easy to tell the whole story. So how do we do this now? My wife and I are volunteers, we set up Learning a lot from APAC, by the way. Don't forget, it was heavily supported by the Jewish community. It went to Israel many times. And we set up exactly what the Jewish community had. I set up a uh, lobby called the Albanian American Civic League, registered under IRS code 501c4. Cannot take a deduction. That's an investment for freedom for the Albanian people. And we've used that money to lobby. But Shirley and I have conducted hearings. We have them on YouTube. If you want to see us, you know, in action, just press YouTube Albanian or Dear Body, and you'll see 50, 10 minute or less YouTube videos on what we've done and more going up. Thank God I put everything on video and now it's being digitized so people can get it. Uh, but we set up the, 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 the lobby, the league, which is a lobby. Then we set up a foundation, which is what produced this book, because the foundation is to educate people, not to lobby for legislation, which we did again in resolutions. And we got the United States government, it took 25 years, to endorse Kosovo 
as a new state. Shirley and I created a new state. How many people do you know created a new state? We did. It took 25 years. Uh, and it's got now 62 countries that have recognized it. Israel not yet. That's why we're heavily passing this around so people know there is a moral debt that the Jewish people owe to the state of Israel. You know, politics being politics, they don't want to jump yet, and they, but they should because the United States was the first to recognize this all. Okay, Israel should have been the second, but that's okay. We're going to now make the case. We don't give up. Persistence is what pays in life. Okay. So and then we have the final thing is a public affairs committee, a PAC, the Albanian American Public Affairs Committee, because you have to reward those people, as you've done, the Jewish community, who support your issues, right? You've done it with congressmen, with senators, and whatnot. We've done it. So we've taken a page from what the Jewish people have done in America to get their voice, to be a loud voice, an effective voice for change. And thank God I went to Congress because that's one of the best things that I learned. So now you've got the situation of 600 years ago, and I just want to show you something because it's amazing. You have to see, you're going to get a geography lesson tonight and a history lesson besides, okay? And a lesson on human rights. I'm going to stay here because this little camera takes six hours to film. I do a weekly TV show on cable in my district, and you're going to be on a half hour show. We'll edit it to show that, you know, this group was nice enough to listen. Now, look at this one. People say, Albania, oh, where is that? In the Caucasus? Is it someplace near Russia? Is it on the other side of Turkey? No. Look, here is how my father's people fled the Ottoman Turks, 45 miles, closest point, closer than Key West is to Cuba and Haiti. And you can imagine in the year 1488, the boats and the rafts and whatnot, because the Albanians held up the Ottomans from conquering Europe for 27 years. They were the army of the day. They were the army that Italy brought in the kingdom. Don't forget, Italy only was formed in 1861. We're talking about the kingdom of Naples and Sicily back then. So when they needed to overcome the French coming in this way, this I tell my Italian friends, you'd be speaking French today, not Italian, if it weren't for the Albanian. They had to bring in the Albanian army twice to overcome the Lombards, okay? But this great general, George Castriati, probably don't remember him or heard the name. Shirley's right on the screen, play right, play right now. It is better than Braveheart. You go to Italy, go to Budapest, go to Vienna, and ask yourself, why is his statue there, 16 feet tall with the sword on the horse? They built those 700 years ago, 200, 300, because they know he saved Europe from being Islamic, all right? Because they wore him down after 27 years, and then, his son could not do after he died of pneumonia in, in uh, the year 1468. So it took another 20 years for the Turks to overrun. And now, look at these dots. Shirley and I brought National Geographic to these areas in 1999. If you want to see the story, Albanians, the people undone, look at the February 2000 issue and you'll see a wonderful story. And why is that there? Because they called me as an expert on Kosovo. Oh, we're going to Italy to the Straits of Utrato, we noticed there are refugees coming from Kosovo and Albania, and we'd like for you to tell us, you know, the history of these refugees and whatnot, and, and tell us more about this Kosovo war. We saw you on CNN, we saw you at, at Congress fighting with Senator Biden in 1998 at the Senate hearing. And he said, wait a minute, I have your subscription. You're National Geographic, you're not a political journal. What are you doing writing about the Kosovo war? Your other journals could do that. You should be writing about who are these Albanian people. And do you know that my father is Albanian from Italy? No. And do you know today there are 200,000 Italians that speak Albanian? No. Can you take us there? We'll do that. So we took them. And that's why you see my father's town, Gretchen, all these dots, 51 of them, are the Albanian-speaking villages in Italy today. These are Italians. But they never forgot. Like you never forgot who you were. You may have come from some other country, they never forgot. And my father comes here bringing that language with him and revives in me my roots originally. And I feel morally, this is my mitzvah for my father's people to be in front of you today. I was raised in a Jewish neighborhood, so I know a lot of that. <laughs> so, so here we are, 45 miles. It's an amazing story. And, and here's Albania. Now, guess what else is close to Albania? Israel. It's like going from Washington to New York, maybe a little bit longer. And what they're finding now in Albania 
is going to knock your socks off. It hasn't been announced yet, but for years, the University of Jerusalem has been working with the University of Toronto in Albania. There's a very unbelievable Roman settlement here that they've uncovered called Butrent, B-U-T-R-I-N-T. And as they're uncovering it, they come across uh, a Byzantine church, first century, and they wanted to figure out what, you know, what, what, you know, what this was all about. In the excavation, they find out there was a Jewish gathering place. They didn't call them synagogues in those days. So as they, they figured this must have been from the first uh, burning of the, the first temple, just around the time of Masada, 70 uh, AD in the common era, guess what else they find? Not your socks off. Has it been announced? The oldest Jewish gathering place in the world from the burning of the first temple, 450 BC. The president of Albania ordered the road diverted and now excavating the entire site. This is down in southern Albania, a place called Flor uh, Saranda. And it's going to be, I believe, one of the great destinations for tourists, especially Jewish people, to see you know, what this was all about. Nothing was called a synagogue in those days. They were all gathering places for the Jewish people who fled Israel twice. 450 BC and 70 AD, and then the Spanish Inquisition. But there are Albanians here, the Jewish Albanians, they just don't forget, they didn't abandon their Jewishness. They actually had synagogues in Albania all these years, gathering places that became synagogues. But there is a group that are called the Romanians. It's in this book. You can read. I hope you read this book. You, you will be amazed. Who are the Romanians? These are the Jewish maidens from the tribe of the Kohanim that was brought to Rome as slaves, 10,000. There's Jewish blood all over Italy, okay? 10,000. Some of those ships never made it. And the wind blows from here to here. They were shipwrecked. And you'll see it in this book. So those never made it to Rome. They were in Albania, stayed there, and integrated with the uh, Albanian people who kept their Jewish religion. Amazing story. So I just wanted you to see that, so you have that, and if you're interested in the National Geographic article, I have a, a card, Shirley has a card, we'll leave them here, and anything you want, you want my book or you want that, we'll be pleased to do it. Information's power, right? Without information, and you are kind of missionaries in a way, you're gonna hopefully take this message to your friends and say, I heard something here that is so incredible, and you're gonna read Shirley's article, Jewish Survival in Albania and the Ethics of Besser, which was published in the uh, Congress, con what was the Congress Weekly, Shirley? The Congress Monthly. The Congress Monthly, it's the American Jewish Congress magazine, and it talks about a lot of things you should know. Now, don't block the camera, please. <laughs> so, the, the last thing I want to say, because I want Shirley to come up to talk about this wonderful thing, is how did we really do this? It wasn't easy for a junior member of the minority party. Don't forget, I was a Republican when the Senate and the House were controlled by Democrats, even though Reagan was president. How do you get anything done? You have to have a lot of, you have to be bold, number one, and you've got to be focused, and you have to have information, and you have to have good allies. I did nothing important in Congress without a Democrat, usually a liberal Democrat. John Conyers, the black American from Michigan, helped pass the CFO Act uh, and the Financial Management Act of 1990. My bill, it's the 20th anniversary next year, already saved billions of dollars. I'll be speaking about that around America next year. Uh, Bonnie Frank, how more liberal Democrat can you be? He introduced with me in August 1988 the Ethics Reform Bill to bring a public review board over the Ethics Committee. He didn't pass it, and he's got the same problem today. Congress wants to be judge and jury with their friends. It doesn't work. And but the piece de resistance is Congressman Tom Bantos, Jewish American, survivor from the Holocaust, born in Hungary. And I came back with the word Kosovo because I was on the uh, executive committee of the Congressional Human Rights Caucus. Why? Why? Imagine being in a district with 46 synagogues and not being a human rights activist and not understanding apartheid or Soviet Jewry, or the issue of Tibet, which was Randos' favorite issue. So when I brought this with him, because nobody knew Kosovo. He was the only one. He says, John, I was born in Hungary. I know the history of the Albanian people. 
I know George Castriani. I know that my landsman, Janusz von Yadid, was his contemporary. They fought the Turks together. Tom, what do we do about this? And I told him the story that I had heard. We had still not gotten this story. This came by accident when I brought Tom Lantos to Albania in 1990. So we worked 85, 86, 87, 88. Okay? We got some resolutions in. We started preparing the people for this new age Hitler called Milosevic. Showing I had to go to The Hague to testify against him. On the first day, he mentions my name that gave me the right to go and testify in The Hague. And he blamed everything on me, that I was Satanizing the Serbian people, Satanizing him. But we had the facts. He was at the Clinton, and there was a genocide going on. It started in Bosnia, and it was just about to happen in Kosovo. Had I not prepared, in 1985, at least the Congress and the Senate, for what was coming, because we knew there was this antipathy between the Serbs and the Albanians, and they were trying to make it a religious war, when it wasn't, it was, a, it was a, not a, even an ethnic thing, it was more of a uh, human rights situation that no one quite understood. So Tom and I got very close. I helped him with the Soviet Jewry area, I raised money for him, I brought him to New York many times, and he said, Joe, you know, this Albanian thing is fascinating. It's like you're bringing me back to my roots. I have one request of you. I've traveled everywhere in the world. I would like to be the first to go to Albania with you. I hear they're trying to bring you there. The communist regime did not go down with the Berlin Wall, believe it or not. A year later, that hard communist regime was still there. The nut had died five years before, and the Hozier, the psychotic person who put, you know, a wall around Albania. If you left, you were shot. If you tried to get in, you were shot. That's why there were so many. Today, you're going to find the most beautiful, preserved things because no one has been able to excavate anything for 50 years. And off coast, forget it. They didn't have the equipment 50 years ago, maybe. But even if they did, nobody would be allowed to do it. So the future of Albania is going to be a tremendous destination for the history because these boats, as I said, blow towards that direction. So there are many wrecks right off the coast of Albania, and Shirley and I got involved with that briefly as well. But I told Tom, Tom, you know, you've done so much for so many people, and look what you've done to empower me, a junior member of the minority party, on this issue. The Albanian people love you. You can be sure I won't set foot in Kosovo or in Albania without you. And the occasion came, uh, after the Berlin Wall came down, Albania was starting to get very nervous that they had to do something, and they were really putting pressure through their embassy on me. They wanted to honor me as the hero of the Albanian people. And I was told by my shrewd Albanian friends, they just want to own you. They will use those pictures the way they want. They will slice and dice. And it's going to look like you, who's never supported communism, are supporting this regime. Don't do it. If you're going to go, and you should go, you have to go to a city member. Shirley Cloyes de Aguani was raised in uh, Westfield, New Jersey, and has a phenomenal scholastic background. She graduated with a degree in sociology from Oberlin College and a Master of Divinity from Union Theological Seminary in New York City. She studied Indonesian language at the University of California at Berkeley and then taught for two years at Satya Wakana University in Central Java, where she directed a program on inter-ethnic relations and development. She has written and lectured widely about the Balkan conflict and is the Balkan Affairs Advisor to the Albanian American Civic League, a position she has held since 1995. She's been enormously involved with members of Congress to bring lasting peace and stability to the Balkans. She created a videotape project on the role that Albanians played in rescuing every Jew who lived in Albania or sought asylum there during the Nazi Holocaust. She's an author and has been involved in publishing. Shirley Cloyes Diawadi was raised in uh, Westfield, New Jersey, and has a phenomenal scholastic background. She graduated with a degree in sociology from Oberlin College and a Master of Divinity from Union Theological Seminary in New York City. She studied Indonesian language at the University of California at Berkeley and then taught for two years at Satya Wakana University in Central Java, 
where she directed a program on inter-ethnic relations and development. She has written and lectured widely about the Balkan conflict and is the Balkan Affairs Advisor to the Albanian American Civic League, a position she has held since 1995. She's been enormously involved with members of Congress to bring lasting peace and stability to the Balkans. She created a videotape project on the role that Albanians played in rescuing every Jew who lived in Albania or sought asylum there during the Nazi Holocaust. She's an author and has been involved in publishing. Every uh, generation has to fight fascism and ultranationalism, or we'll come back. If we understand anything about the Holocaust, um, we should understand that. And so I decided to embark on this book publishing project that uh, Joe mentioned to try to bring the perspective of the anti-war, anti its opposition from inside the former Yugoslavia to the American public. Now, why would I have made that decision? And I can tell you that, and this is very important, I grew up in a relatively privileged Presbyterian family in Westfield, New Jersey, and I was about uh, 10 years old when the Eichmann trials began, and I certainly wasn't reading the New York Times then, but I saw the pictures of the ovens in Auschwitz on, on the cover of the, of the Times. And, sorry. and I came to my parents and I asked, you know, I asked for an explanation. And it was the beginning of my awakening and my commitment to um, genocide prevention. That was uh, the way I began my life. Now, fast forward today, we're in a really important juncture in history. We've got maybe maximum 10 years. When most of the survivors of the Shoah and um, rescuers are going to have passed on. And therefore, it's extremely important, in my opinion, for us to fill in as many gaps in the Holocaust history as we possibly can while they are still alive. And we also have to understand, I think, um, this is one of my favorite books, as um, Shoshana Feldman and Dr. Dory Lau have in you know, their book, Testimony. Uh, they said, the history of the Holocaust is essentially not over. It's a history whose repercussions are not simply omnipresent, but whose consequences are still actively evolving. And they cite Eastern Europe as one of the examples. Now, as many of you know, as soon as Eastern European countries emerged from the Holocaust and the horrors of it, they were immediately put under the yoke of communism, and the communists suppressed all discussion, knowledge of the Holocaust for years, and they were talking about 50, 50 years. So um, recovering this lost history and bearing witness to it um, in my opinion, is absolutely essential if we really care about never again and, and ensuring that it, is, it happens not, never more. Now, um, Joe gave you some description of the Albanian world. I'm going to try to make this, I think, consolidated, make it a little easier. There are 15, the number of Jews and the number of Albanians in the world are almost the same. 15 million, 16 million, am I, am I correct about that? Um, Albanians are the oldest um, ethnic group in the Balkans. They're the indigenous uh, population. They were the Illyrians. And they came thousands of years ago. Um, they are different from their Slavic neighbors. They use the Roman alphabet. Um, originally, uh, they were all Christians and some Jews, as Joe said, for the reasons he described what happened. Um, then, and, and this is also very similar to Jewish history, they had to fight off waves and waves and waves of oppression and occupation. So by the 14th century, um, we have what, what becomes 350 years of Ottoman occupation. And that's the point where, you know, you, you may hear in your travels or on television that, oh, Albanians, aren't they Muslims? Aren't they all? Aren't they all? Um, and the thing that happened, in fact, was that it was an imposed Islam that was never accepted. Albanians are only those who are Muslim, and the, the, they are the majority. Albanians are Muslim, Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, Christians, and Jews. Um, they are just nominally um, Muslim. 
And so that oppression lasted for many, many years, for 400 to be exact. And then no sooner did they emerge from that, there were the Balkan Wars of 1912-1913, in which the Ottoman Empire fell. Then we have World War I, and um, coming out of World War I, this is why Albanians revere Americans so much, Woodrow Wilson managed to keep the state of Albania intact. This was once all of Albania, and all the other Albanian lands were carved up. That's why you may have some confusion about Kosovo, Albania. Well, there's Macedonia, Montenegro, Kresheva, Chamria in Greece, Kosovo, and the state of Albania. So suddenly, at the end of World War I, we have Albania, and now outside of it, all the other Albanian lands under uh, Slavic domination. Now, and this is a really important part of the story of why Albanians uh, came, to, came, came to save Jews, because how did they survive this onslaught and still maintain who they were? Um, and they did it because they had this whole history of religious tolerance, resistance, and hope in response to all these successive waves of domination from the Romans to the Ottomans and even later to the Nazis and the Communists because of something called Kanun and its underlying code called Besa. And the Kanun is basically a system of customary laws for how you deal with every aspect of your life. And Besa, which lies at the heart, has different meanings. It ranges from faith, trust, truth, or word of honor, sacred promise and obligation that keeps one's word, to provide hospitality and protection, and above all, it involves uncompromising protection of the guest. In any Albanian house, you'll see the, that uh, the guest is more important than even any member of the family. And the canoon requires, and Bessa requires, that if um, you have a guest, in your house, um, you even have to go to the point of forfeiting your own life in order to save um, the life of anyone seeking ref refuge. So it was Besa, not religion, that underlay the Albanian uh, saving role during World War II. Um, it, it begins, by the way, just so you know, initially um, it was Mussolini in 1939. It was the Italians that came into Albanian lands. Uh, they invaded, they occupied, in 43 they were followed by the Nazis. And they remained, of course, until the end of the war. Now, when European Jewry began fleeing um, uh, Western Europe, um, at that time there were 200 Jews living, already living in Albania. And um, there were actually many more archaeological evidence, you know, documents the presence of Jews, as Joe said, from the epic of the Roman rule. But at various points, they move on to other lands. You have people, you know, there was a lot of migration going on in those days for economic reasons largely. It wasn't because they had to flee Albania. Um, they might have gone into Venice. They were traders. Um, they were spread um, throughout the, out, out the um, region. Um, at the end of the war, and this is the only um, country that can claim this, there were more than 2,000 Jews living in Albania, so more than um, existed before, the only nation that can claim they rescued every Jew who made it to Albanian lands. Now, on the one hand, some scholars would argue that the fact that Albanians were completely closed off for so long, they were, they were separated from um, the, the, the universe of anti-Semitism. They really didn't have any exposure to institutionalized anti-Semitism. So this was a crucial factor, of course. And in fact, I, I love this. One of the witnesses to this reality happens to be a Jew, an American Jew, and we're very fortunate in this, who was ambassador to Albania in the 1930s. And his name was um, Herman Bernstein, and he, um, he was actually just there from 30 to 33. And he wrote in his letters to Washington, quote, there is no trace of any discrimination against Jews in Albania, because Albania happens to be one of the rare lands in Europe today where religious prejudice and hate do not exist, even though Albanians themselves are divided into three faiths. Um, nevertheless, the principal reason 
for Albanian saving Jews was the history of the Kanun and of Vesa. And so um, another interesting component of this is that the Western concept of foreigner, we're all can, we all understand the concept of foreigner, it doesn't even exist in the Kanun, only the concept of the guest. Hence, and this was said often, there were no Jewish foreigners in Albania during World War II, only Jewish guests who had to be sheltered and protected even at the risk of Albanian lives. So the Albanian rescue of Jews was, as I said before, not a religious act, it was an Albanian act. And this is important too, it involved every part of the population from the political elite to the rural pe uh, peasantry. This is very rare. And I'll never forget in November of 2007, when Joe and I went to Yad Vashem and, uh, for the first time. And we were taken, we were very fortunate, we were taken on a private uh, tour through the museum. And I don't know, I'm sure many people in this room have been there. Towards the end, there are these tower photographs of people who, of, of the executioners, of the, the, the main architects of the final solution, but not all the ones that we would typically think about. I mean, it wasn't just, you know, you know Goebbels, for example. Um, it was, um, it, there were people I had never even heard of, and there had been a great debate about whether to put their photographs there. It's as if they were being, in some ways, reified, you know, in history, and there was a little biography attached to each. What was the reason they decided to do it? And I, I, this is so powerful. Almost all of them were PhDs. Almost all of them were products of the European Enlightenment. Mm -hmm. Almost all of them were products of the leading German universities. They had become totally unhinged from any ethical base. And yet Albania, most of whom had no education who were involved in the rescue, had held on to their humanity and had extended it. And that is, you know, to me, um, it, it, it tells us a lot, I think, about what we have to do even today. And um, there's one story that I think is remarkable, um, a good example, and it will show just how, you know, the extent to which Albanians went to save Jewish lives. There was a story of a shop owner in a little town called Puka. His name was Ali Alia. And in 43, a German transport, so now we're, you know, the Nazis are in Albania. There was a German transport carrying 19 Albanian uh, prisoners on their way to hard labor. And one was a Jew, and he was going to be shot. He was already, you know, uh, identified for, for death. And they stopped outside of Leah's store and sizing up the situation, and this was, you know, again, the German transport wants to stop and get something to drink and eat and they just want to take it. And Aliyah spoke actually excellent German. I don't know how that happened to be, but he invited the Nazis into the store, offered them food, and then purposely plied them with wine until they were drunk. So while they were drinking, um, Aliyah uh, convinced the Nazis that they should give uh, uh, food to the prisoners. And he handed the one young Jewish prisoner a piece of melon. And in it, he had concealed a note and it told him to flee into the woods and to wait for him in a designated place. When the Nazis got ready to leave Aliyah's store, they discovered the Jewish pr prisoner was missing and they were furious. They dragged Ali Aliyah into the village square. They pinned him against a wall. Four times they put a gun to his head, threatening to shoot. He refused to say a thing. He maintained his innocence. Then they left to search for the prisoner. When they returned at the end, they threatened to burn the entire village down if he didn't confess. He didn't confess. And finally, miraculously, they didn't burn the village down. The Germans left Putin for good. Aliyah went, retrieved the prisoner, and today, um, and hit him, in, oh, hit him in his home for two years until the war was over. And today, he's a dentist living in Mexico. <laughs> and we met him in that Jerusalem. And we met him, we met him at Hakusha. Um, you know, and, and another thing, I mean, there are so many stories, but Muslims and Christian Albanians not only risked their lives to save Jews, but under no circumstances, at any time, and this is often asked, did they, were they, you know, seeking compensation or any reward? Um, after the war, Abraham Eliasov, who was known as Abraham Ghani when he was being hit, went to Betur Chosha, who had sheltered him, and Betur Chosha is alive, he's 93. 
um, living in Albania, and he wanted to, to give him something, give him money, and he said, no, Albanians give Bessa to a friend. We never sell it. Um, extraordinary. So, to go back to the sort of historical point, early on, Albanians were hiding uh, Jews and protecting them on their own initiative in an uncoordinated way. It was simply the response to Bessa and the tradition. But then it became more dangerous when the Germans arrived, of course. And, and I, I didn't say this, I should have before. At a number of points, the Italians and then later the Germans tried to get the Albanian government, so this is what I mean, we're talking about the top levels, and they could have easily, um, you know, corrupted people. Uh, they could have done all sorts of things. They tried to convince them to turn over the lists of everyone, and they refused to do it. In fact, the Albanians kind of made a deal with the Italians initially. You can come here, but you won't be doing that. Um, so when once the Germans are in, the pressure is on, and um, so they started to become more organized, and they set up what were called National Liberation Councils in towns and villages where Jews were hiding, and then they set up a, a system to move them from place to place, either with false passports or disguised as Albanian peasants. The um, officials passed nominally some anti-Jewish regulations just to keep the Nazis you know, at bay, um, but it was just to placate them. They never enforced a single one. Then when the Germans asked Albanian leaders to provide the list, they refused openly, and that's been documented and that's been written about. Um, and then as the late uh, philanthropist, Jewish philanthropist Harvey Sarner, whose book we're going to give you, Rescue in Albania, showed it to you earlier, he said the importance of Albania as a sanctuary is demonstrated by the fact that only 10% of the 70,000 Jews who were in the surrounding area of Yugoslavia, really hadn't become Yugoslavia yet, that happens after the war survived the Holocaust, but I, I want to add, um, I want to insert something though into this part of the story because this is now evolving. Um, that would have included Kosovo. The truth of the matter is, any Jews who made it into Albania made it to made it to Albania through the help of Albanians in Kosovo, Macedonia, and Montenegro. Uh, again, um, we didn't even I think have the name Macedonia then but all the outlying areas. And um, in the spring of uh, last year, uh, Mustafa Rezniki, in his 80s, was finally recognized by Yad Vashem. He was um, uh, a child at the time, but for his family-saving role, they saved 400 um, Jews. Um, they were in Kosovo. They were in um, sort of the countryside area, but his father was a traitor and had been working with Jewish colleagues in different parts of Western Europe, um, Thessalonica in Greece, had a whole history. So Jews had started to escape into um, his uh, village of Jacoba and Bichan in the 1930s. He already had Jews living on his property for a number of years. And then ultimately, of course, when uh, the Germans were really, the Nazis were moving in earnest, um, and searching, then he, he, he was able to develop the network based on his traitor's network to get them out of Macedonia, Kosovo, and, and into Albania. Unfortunately, uh, Mustafa died two months after the award was given. Um, his, son, his grandson carries on what's called the Kosovo Israeli Friendship Society. There are two associations, one in Kosovo and one in Albania. After Albanians fell under communism, for 50 years they were cut off from everyone they rescued and from the rest of the world. But they started these organizations to carry on that history. And some are connecting now. I've been working with that family and with the grandson. And because I knew he was ill, I set up an oral history project and filmed about six and a half hours of tape with him that we will eventually turn into you know, a sort of short film, and I'll produce um, a, an, an article so that we can begin to show that component. And this is very important at a time when um, many other people uh, won't go into all the details of trying to miscast um, what actually happened um, in the Albanian world. Uh, It connected to that in the 50 years from World War II to the fall of the Berlin Wall. 
of course, most of the world didn't know this story. Um, I didn't know this story. I'm sure you didn't know this story about the unique role that Albanians play because the entire history, culture, and reality of Albanians was concealed by their oppressors in Albania. As Joe said before, we had this horrible communist dictator, Emperor Hojna, and then we had Tito, you know, in the rest of the of what became um, and was by then the former Yugoslavia. For a brief period of time during the Kosovo War, 1998 to 1991, the international spotlight came on the Albanian world. Most people, having grown up in the United States, learned very little about Eastern European history. But for that very brief period of time, when we saw Albanians put on cattle cars and being thrust over the border and a million, you know, being um, uh, pushed out of Kosovo, um, 12,000 were murdered, um, refugee camps, I'm sure you saw, you know, the television coverage of people and thousands of people in refugee camps for that brief period of time. There was some understanding, and that was the period, by the way, in which Joe and I started to distribute Harvey Sonner's book, started to work really closely with members of Congress, there were 34 Jewish members of Congress, and I would say they, the two of us, and Joe Biden actually led and the fight to stop us. Um, it wasn't Bill Clinton. <laughs> um, the only person that uh, really had any um, concern inside the administration was Madeleine Albright. And that ultimately um, was decisive too um, in ending the war. And um, by that time, of course, by the time we intervened there, already 350,000 people had died in Bosnia. Four million had been displaced throughout the Balkans. And there were only 12 thousand reported dead in Kosovo, there would have been many more if NATO had not invaded. Um, since the end of the war, um, the spotlight, of course, has dimmed again. We now have Iraq and Afghanistan, major wars. We have uh, North Korea, um, we have Iran. Um, the spotlight is no longer on the Albanian world, and 125 years of a history of expulsion, arrest, torture, imprisonment, and genocide now have the, are in danger of going back into the uh, backwater of history once more. And into this situation, tragically, we have um, Serbia and some other forces trying to miscast Albanians as a Muslim, potentially uh, terrorist fundamentalist force in the heart of Europe. And nothing could be further from the truth, and I hope I've illustrated that in telling the story about what happened in the Holocaust and um, what goes on to this day. I mean, there are literally Albanians uh, in Albania still holding on to things like a sewing machine and other, other goods left behind by the families that they say waiting for them to come back. So as a corrective to the misrepresentation of Albania, um, Joe and I felt that it was very important to tell this story. The story is important in its own right because it's an essential part of the Holocaust. And, um, we need to know about it. But um, we, we also can't forget that Milosevic was allowed to wield state-sponsored terrorism against non-Serbs and that, once again, the United States and Western Europe were complicit in that process. It went on for 10 years, and we know very much that our country was complicit during the Holocaust. And, and that has to be recognized as well. Um, we haven't learned the lessons of the Holocaust in short. So uh, it's a vital, I, what I try to say um, to our government is vital um, importance that in fact we don't have a fundamentalist terrorist Muslim force in the heart of Europe. We have an incredible group of people for religions living side by side in harmony for centuries that have much to teach us going forward. Um, we have a choice to make. Um, we can have a world based on Milosevic's nightmarish vision of racial purity and ethnically cleansed many states throughout Europe, reminiscent of Hitler. Or we can have a multicultural, multi-religious world um, that Albanians represent. I think that with that. Thank you.
anything about Bulgaria, which had a similar history? Sure. Of, uh, yes, same and Jews? if you don't mind. I'll hand the books out now. Um, yeah, yeah, borrow that one for a minute. Uh, Shirley had to respond to that in writing. This because this is really important. Um, and this is a very hard for me, too, because um, when I wrote this article you're going to get to is survival and the ethics of VESA for Congress Monthly in 2006. I got this, I received this, and I was allowed to respond to it. Amazing letter from, that was published in my response from uh, Milford Lieberthal saying, you know, this is really wonderful and, uh, the, you know, the article that's really close to you already did, but, you know, while this rescue of 2,000 was magnificent, what about the Bulgarians of 50,000? And, you know, I said, I don't want to have to compare heroisms or create a hierarchy of heroisms and sufferings in response to the extermination of the Jewish people during the Nazi Holocaust. Nothing can diminish, I want to read part of this, Bulgaria's savings of its 50,000 Jewish citizens while it had a pact with the Axis powers. And I won't read all of it. What they did was to be applauded, but in any case, I wrote, the assertion that Albania is the only nation that can claim that every Jew within its borders was rescued from the Holocaust is based on the fact that, you know, no one was handed over. No one. But, um, and that the, the persons saved were mostly not Albanian uh, citizens, but Jews who had fled to that country. But the records show, and you can read the whole thing, I don't want to spend too much time, the records show that Bulgaria did not receive the distinction of saving every Jew because while Bulgaria did not deport Bulgarian Jews, it deported the Nazi to the Nazi death camps, 11,000 non-Bulgarian Jews in the territory that it annexed from Macedonia and Greece, and the fact that it was Urban who had to leave, yes. who told me that the number is actually higher, that I have the number for Macedonia, but he said when you combine it all, it was 50,000 from Trace. And in addition, Jews inside Bulgaria were discriminated against, and after 94, all Bulgarian Jewish men between the ages of 20 and 40 were rounded up and sent into forced labor. And then I go on to say that, you know, I'm not interested in some type of exceptionalism. Albanians are still a people at risk, Bulgarians are not. So it is important, obviously, to recognize, I mean, 50,000 saved is, is, is incredible but it isn't the whole picture. And it's, it, uh, you know, what I'm concerned about, which is not what you're doing. Some people are coming to us saying, well, how dare you, how dare you say this? You know, oh, Bulgaria is the one. Um, I think there's enough room for everyone, you know, who, who helped and made a difference and risked their lives. But that is the, the actual.